So hello everybody. Um, yeah. So this talk is uh, about Python. It's about Python scientific stack. I want to give a short, uh, very short introduction because we have about uh, 30 minutes. So it's a quite ambitious goal. So we are more interested in getting a feeling at, at what is there and um, to give you some orientation if you're interested in, top, in this topic and it's more aimed at beginners and newcomers. So if you're working with Python on, let's say, on a regular basis, there won't be that many new things for you. So about me, I work as a data scientist at the Austrian Institute of Technology. There I mainly do statistical modeling and uh, data analysis together with uh, visualizations. And yeah, I'm using Python for a few years now. Before that, I was primarily using MATLAB and also R to some extent. And yeah, when I started, I was quite uh, confused because you have uh, a lot of different projects and uh, yeah, it's, it's open source. And so every now and then somebody starts uh, a new project on its own, <laughs> on its own. And then there are all so many different ways to do things that it's quite complicated when you're not used to it. So I want to give you some, some overview of how the scientific stack is structured and then we'll take a look at some examples uh, so that you see how, how these tools are applied in practice. Before we go into detail, uh, if you're interested in this topic, Python and, uh, and data, there is currently a meetup under construction. It's uh, PyData if you want to look it up, PyData Vienna. Uh, yeah. But it's not the, the content of this <laughs> presentation here. Mm -hmm. So, let's see. So, what are we going to talk about? First, uh, we will try to answer the question why you might consider Python for scientific computing. Then, um, I would like to show you how this scientific stack is structured, then, how to get started. And finally, we have a few examples. I prepared three, but we'll see how far we get. And hopefully, there's also time for your questions. So. Okay, why consider Python for scientific computing? Well, there is a, is a quote, and I think it uh, quite nicely summarizes um, why, why Python is interesting. For those who know MATLAB, uh, yeah, MATLAB is a very wide, widely used tool for numerical analysis, and it's, um, yeah, it's a wonderful language for some purposes. And this quote is a wonderful language for a wide range of numerical analysis. However, it is a terrible language for which to do anything else. And this is, I mean, it's also my personal opinion, but who am I? <laughs> um, and this, this guy wrote uh, Python. It's a Python implementation in Python. And he was one of the founders of Numeric, so an ancestor of NumPy. So, um, what else? Of course, Python is open source. It ships with a lot of uh, libraries for scientific computing. They are quite mature. Since it's a scripting language, you can do rapid prototyping. Uh, but there are also, since it's a general purpose programming language, a lot of tools that aid the development process. So you have a lot of conventions, you have tools for testing, uh, uh, for, for cross-platform development, and so on. And therefore, it's similar in what it provides to MATLAB and R, but with a different, uh, let's say, perspective in mind. So there was Python, and then later on, this uh, scientific stack evolved. Whereas MATLAB or R are primarily developed for scientific computing. And yeah, I, I once asked a colleague of mine, yeah, well, why aren't we using MATLAB or R? And yeah, his answer was quite short. It's just the right tool for the job. And as I say, it's an alternative. You choose what you like. But I think it's uh, if you if you're not familiar with uh, Python stack, you should take a look at it. So, and there are also others using Python for scientific building. This is a summary that I collected uh, just looking, googling for googling. By the way. <laughs> Uh, for a few minutes, there are of course other companies, but these are some names that I guess most of you are familiar with. So, how does it look like? In, in 
Python, there is a, a project and an organization that's called SciPy, which is scientific Python. And within SciPy, some libraries are, are uh, developed and, and maintained. And the core library is NumPy. And NumPy provides basically data types and, and core functions. And as long as you can express your algorithms in these, uh, these uh, data types, you get uh, very good, very good performance because since it's an interpreted language, it's of course not as fast as, uh, as for example, C, C++ or whatever. And from numerical calculations, this is really a bottleneck. But uh, with NumPy, you get array computing and uh, and and huge uh, performance gains. However, with data types and basically the algebra and MFTs and so, there's not much to do. So. There is a SciPy, the SciPy library, in contrary to the SciPy project, and uh, the SciPy library then provides you with a lot of tools that you will need in, in uh, yeah, let's say in your daily work. So for optimization, signal processing, and statistics, there is SciPy. And of course, there is no project without plotting, uh, for plotting your method clip. And on top of these, there are more specialized libraries, for example, Pandas. We'll take a quick look at Pandas later on, which is basically for uh, data analysis, um, which provides so-called data frames, which are inspired by R. And we'll have to talk later about R. It has very powerful I/O functionality, and for group by apply operations, are very well supported and also for for time series uh, analysis. If you are interested in symbolic um, computation or computer algebra, there's SymPy. And then there is the IPython project um, that we will see later on. So the presentation here is actually a, a Jupyter notebook in presentation mode. So we, you will see later on what this means. But this is something that evolved out of the IPython project. Of course, I mean these are some very these are the core libraries, and then there's uh, much more. So for example, uh, if you need some Statistics, uh, some uh, statistical models, you might find them in, in stats models. If you're into machine learning, there's scikit-learn. If you are into image process, there's scikit-image. If you are um, more on the natural language processing side, there's the natural language toolkit. And yeah, and on and on and on. But the core libraries are the ones I mentioned before, and almost all other projects build on top of these. So. The question is how you get these things running, especially under Windows. It's often a bit tricky because um, there are wrappers around C and Fortran libraries. And uh, the easiest way is just to use a scientific distribution because unlike uh, MATLAB or, for example, in MATLAB, I mean, it's super easy. You just download yeah. or buy, <laughs> depends. <laughs> uh, <laughs> everything and it's just contained in a single box and you never have to leave it. But in Python it's not that obvious, but scientific distributions ship uh, with a lot of uh, a lot of libraries and then you just can get started. So they have a same default of packages. They offer package environment management, which is a great a great plus. You have interactive Python, you get spider. Spider is a very simple IDE. It's like R Studio or MATLAB. And then you have the, the Jupyter Notebook, which we'll see shortly in action. So this was in uh, just a few words what there is. And uh, now we have, I don't know, 20 to 15 minutes <laughs> uh, to see how this looks like <laughs> when, you, when you apply these tools. Do you have any questions so far? OK, that's fine. Then we have more time for the for examples. So, so um, yeah, say we have a, a wage data set, and um, in, this, in this data set we have uh, the, the income of 3,000 people, and we want to know how the income depends on the age of a person and on education. And we have a data set that comprises 3,000 3, entries, and we want to quickly explore this. And we can use pandas for data analysis, and then we do some plots using 
Seaborn. Seaborn is a library that's based on Matplotlib. It's inspired a bit by ggplot, if you, if you know ggplot. And yeah, to do so, we need some imports. Okay, forget about them. You always need imports. So then we have to load the data. And yeah, you have uh, some something that CSV reader. You supply a path, and you get back a data frame. And we later need the order for our plots, but you can forget this for now. So a data frame is like a, a table in Excel. It has uh, columns, it has an index, and we see, okay, the first entry is a person 18 years old. Uh, the record is from 2006. It's a male person who was never married. And somewhere it has an income. The wage is it's in 1,000 US dollars per year. So it's uh, uh, $75,000. Okay. So some information and we want to explore it. So what can we do? We can first ask, okay, what kind of variables are there? And since in Python everything is an object, these data frames also have a lot of attributes. So if you want to check, okay, what kind of variables are there, you can just ask, hmm, give me the columns, and then you get a list. And for example, we have uh, the ones that we have already seen there. Uh, but for now, we are only interested in age and wage. So these are the variables that uh, we are interested in. Often at the beginning, it's useful to get a quick overview of what is there. So we let the data set uh, the describe itself. And for example, we learned that the youngest participant in our study is 18 years old, the oldest is uh, 80 years old, and there is some person earning quite a lot of money. But that's only some raw numbers and not very, very insightful. So we we make a plot. And as I said, the data frame is an object. The data frame supports a plot method, and this plot method uh, can be a scatter plot where we have on the x-axis the age and on the y-axis wage. And we see that there are some high earners on the top, and there is this hmm, well, it seems that. You earn more when you get older, and after, let's say, 30 or so, I don't know how old you are, but there is stagnation. <laughs> okay, but I mean, it's it's hard to read this, so we would like to compute the median and for each age class, and therefore we say, I want to group my data set, I want to group it by age, and then I want to select the variable that's called age, and then I want to aggregate using the mean and I think this is very readable because you say, well, it's just what I said. You group by, you select, and then you aggregate. And what you get back is another data frame that we can then plot and see, okay, basically it's like this. You earn more until 30, 33, and then you earn the same the rest of your life until someday uh, you die or so. <laughs> but. Uh, of course, it's more complicated because uh, maybe it depends on uh, whether you went to school or not. And we can also ask this question, and therefore we make an, another plot, it's a box plot, where we say, okay, I want to group internally, I want to group by educational level, and then I want the uh, wage uh, shown. And this is what we see here. And um, it's actually the case that when you have some advanced degree, you earn most, but it's not uh, necessary because we have here some outliers who quit high school and yeah, are still earning quite a lot. So I don't know what you are, you, you're doing, but this is what the uh, statistic says. But still, this is very incomplete because we know that maybe um, if you have um, some migrational background. Um, there you might be disadvantaged or so. So we could say, I want to group additionally by race in this case. And we get these, uh, these overview graphics where we see, for example, here on the, on the rightmost plot, that if you are other, okay, no, other is maybe not the best example, but let's say if you are black, it's always bad to be black. So we already know that. 
but still here, this is the summary, this is the official proof that you are uh, on the wrong side, kind of, when it comes to income. And yeah, well, you knew this already before, but we, it took us just a few, two lines uh, to get uh, this over, and I think this is quite, quite nice. For those who prefer Excel, you can still, ah, and then you can also change the styling, of course. Uh, and if you need to report this in some kind of overview, then yeah, you just again group by both education and race. You select the variable that you are interested in, namely wage, aggregate, and you get a table and you send it to your boss and say, okay, I did my analysis. That's it. So it's very often about uh, being able to express your things. Uh, in a nice fashion, and this is what you find in most Python libraries because it's an explicit aim uh, of being uh, easy to understand, and this is what you find in other libraries. So this was an example for data analysis and data visualization, a very simple one, of course, but <laughs> but still. Uh, another example that I would like to show you is uh, that we explore a, a differential equation. Are any biologists here, by chance? No. Okay, that's good. <laughs> okay. I, I saw a maybe. <laughs> a maybe. <laughs> but I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. The yeah, it's a very it's a very simple model where you where we have some kind of um, very simplified ecosystem where you have two species, for example, foxes and rabbits, and of course the foxes try to eat the rabbits. And the question is, who dies out first? And this is basically what we will try to model here. Maybe you're not so familiar with this equation. So this is the summary. It's uh, very simple, where we have x is, for example, the number of rabbits, y is the number of uh, foxes, and you can make up this differential equation. Um, it's actually rather easy to understand, but we won't go into details here. What we say is that the rate of change, which is the left-hand side, depends, of course, on how many rabbits in this case are there and how many foxes. If there are a lot of rabbits, they can replicate, and if there are too many foxes, they will eat the rabbits. And this is basically the dynamics that is enclosed in here. And yeah, we can try to solve it and see how it looks like. Again, we need imports. Forget about imports. Then we need a solver. We need a solver for an ordinary differential equation, and there it is. And to use this solver, it says that you have to wrap the right-hand side of your equation, so the right-hand side, this is this part here, in a function. And we can do this, and this is basically the right-hand side. So you have the derivative with respect to both variables, and it's this uh, the thing that we had before. And then you just pass it to a solver. You need to give initial conditions, so how many foxes and rabbits are at the beginning. And then you need time. You always need time, actually. <laughs> and then you solve. That's it, you get this overview. And yeah, if you are into numbers, <laughs> um, yeah, you can take some time and figure it out. Or we again make a plot. And that's it. So, yeah, well, what, what is it that we see here? We have the, the green line, these are the rabbits, and we have foxes. And at the beginning, there are some rabbits, and the rabbits replicate. And as soon as there are enough rabbits, the foxes' population will grow because the foxes are happy that there are so many rabbits. And as the foxes' population increases, um, yeah, they eat all the rabbits. And since the rabbits die out, when there are not enough rabbits, then of course the foxes starve and the foxes population decreases. And then there is this cycle, and it's of course a very simplistic point of view, but still this is more or less how you can imagine how this how the dynamics looks like. And maybe maybe it's nice to have this in the report, but to understand it. Um, a different representation might be useful, and some somebody might say, "Okay, hey, let let's make a GUI 
to sliders and, and then we want to move the sliders and see how how this looks like but I don't know I, I'm, I'm not so much into GUIs and um, I think it's it's tedious and yeah you have to, to fiddle around with a lot of details but um, we can still give it a try and uh, with with a Jupyter notebook it's actually quite simple so namely it's as easy as that that it already ships if you have there's an interactive function and when you pass this function another function with a keyword arguments and provide ranges for the variables then it will automatically produce for example sliders and then you can let's say for example we here we start with half a fox <laughs> and we still see that it does not die. Maybe, maybe this is a modeling error, but <laughs> let's see. So this half of a fox, yeah, it it, uh, it survives until let's say two. And since there are so many rabbits, then that this half of a fox replicates and it gets uh, a a one fox, and then it's yeah, well actually pretty much foxes here. And the thing is that we can now there with the parameters here and this alpha was the coefficient that we had in front of the rabbit population and when we decrease alpha we see that they slowly replicate and when we increase alpha we see that they quickly replicate and then we can say okay uh, beta i don't really know what beta is but you can vary it we could look it up okay but we don't have a lot of time but you can imagine that if you are then discussing the dynamics of the system and arguing, okay, boo, I think that beta is more important than delta, then yeah, I just move the sliders and it's, it was no work. I mean, here we had the plot before and we just wrapped it in a function. <coughs> That's it. So we have to solve it anyway. We have to plot it anyway. And there is the wrapper and then you pass it to some other function and you get all this comfort. And then a nice GUI, so I think that's quite cool. And uh, yeah, then we are preparing for our last very, very, another very simplistic example. Um, are there any doctors here? Medical doctors? So that's also very good. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, we have uh, an example. It's a heart data set. Um, it's, a, it's a classification problem where you have some patients and you know that these patients uh, suffer from a heart disease and then you do some some measurements and an interview and uh, the idea behind this data set is that you want to, to train a classifier that tells you which um, which indicators are important and therefore we can kind of play medical doctors. So again we need imports and we again skip these so the, the data set has a, a chest pain variable, for example, when the patient is okay, I suffer from chest pain. There's also a thallium stress, whoever knows what that is. And there is this heart disease. So there's a test, and if this um, AHD variable says, what's the actual value? No, it, the patient does not suffer from a heart disease, and if it says yes, it does suffer from a heart disease. And we just have to read the data in. We always have to read the data in, of course. We supply the information that some of the variables are categorical uh, to, to use this information later on. And then we have age, we have sex, so a lot of these classic parameters that are used to describe yeah, the patient, for example. And to use then uh, a classifier on this, we will use a, a decision tree. We need to map these, uh, these these textual variables to, to to codes, and we will do this. So in the encoded case, we have numbers, and then we can plug this into a classifier to see, okay, what what is important, what is not so important. And that's actually actually quite simple. So we first have to select our explanatory variables. Often they are called x and often the target variable is called y. So we do this, 
we just uh, take x and y out of our data frame and we say I want the decision tree classifier and, and then I fit the classifier. This is a syntax that when you use Python you encounter in a lot of different libraries because this is again something that is I think quite nice in Python. But this scikit-learn library that we use here is very successful and therefore other libraries that came later tried to provide a similar interface. So often when you have a machine learning library in Python, there is this fit, you first train the model and then you predict something. So even if you use, for example, uh, TensorFlow, then there is a TensorFlow. Okay, TensorFlow is a deep learning uh, library that was open sourced by Google. And there is a wrapper for TensorFlow. And then you can uh, build a super deep neural network and still call a fit method and a predict method. And that's it. So I think having a nice API is always uh, a good thing. And that's why we see this fit here. We won't predict, but we would like to take a look at how, how this tree looks like. And yeah, we have some, uh, some information about this tree. But yeah, we want to, to plot it. It's a tree, so we can we can plot it, okay? To put it simple. And here, uh, this is the result. This is something that R does much better. So at plotting is, uh, <laughs> it's nice, but it's a bit simplistic, but, but it's okay. So, um, question. A couple of quick questions. One is you used MATLAB a lot before you went to Python. In Large matrix operations, what's the speed comparison? Or is it meaningful or is it not? Uh, it's pretty much the same actually, because um, MATLAB is where wraps already existing C or Fortran libraries. And this is what MATLAB does as well. So internally, it's actually quite likely that, especially for basic operations and very well established ones like FFDs or things from numerical linear algebra, that uh, they are repeating the very same library. The second question was, uh, thanks. Uh, the second question was about all your examples concern static data, data that already, they usually speak loud enough, I don't need the mic, but um, how, how do you use Python with data that's coming in fast and furious and is not at rest, that you can't read it in easily? The, you know, the Spark, the Spark uh, sort of business case that you've got streaming data coming in. Um, are there wrappers for Python? I just PySpark if you are. Have you used it? No.